On the island of Madagascar, a team of scientists from around the world have come to explore one of the last virgin territories on the planet, the McKay Massif. Led by explorer Everard Vandenbaum, the team will study this exceptional ecosystem for six weeks. In the McKay, life has adapted in unexpected ways, resisting drought, poor soils, and the influence of outside forces. Life has developed and evolved in this secluded sanctuary, completely self-contained for millions of years. The scientists' mission is to inventory and study all the biodiversity the McKay offers. But above all, they dream of discovering new species and furthering scientific research. As they explore these uncharted hills, the team will cover hallowed ground feared by the natives and rediscover a land forgotten by time. For the expedition scientists, it's the beginning of a unique human adventure that will reveal an isolated world where 80% of the species live nowhere else on the Earth. The French ecologist Tanguy Dufresne will search for rare fish species. Biologist Vincent Prier is a bat specialist. German primologist Reiner Dolch is hoping to find new lemurs, and his American colleague Ed Lewis will study their DNA. Elodie Coutois, a herpetologist, will study the amphibians of the Mackay. It's a dangerous mission for South African Vince Schachs, a crocodile specialist. Belgian Anne Ludissois will work on parasites that transmit infectious diseases. Eric Gontier will lead an archaeological study. And American Brian Fisher will study insects. Like the explorers before them, Everard and his scientific team set out to discover a new world in the heart of Madagascar. Madagascar is the fifth largest island in the world. The Mackay is a massif, a compact group of connected mountains. The Mackay covers around 1,500 square miles in the center of Madagascar. This is the village of Sivuk, the last inhabited place before the massif. At this point, the team will abandon their vehicles and continue on foot. With several tons of equipment to carry into the wilderness, they will need porters. Do you think we can find 80 people here? 80 people who will come with us to the base camp. Just as far as the base camp, but no further. Okay. For expedition leader Everard, the adventure has begun, and the success of the mission lies directly on his shoulders. This is the first diary entry for an expedition, a big project. We're just next to the last little village, from where we'll head into the hills. <laughs> I've got goosebumps. It's pretty stupid having goosebumps looking into a camera. But I'm pleased. And this whole thing has to work out because the scientists who are here have not come this far for nothing. So that adds to the pressure a bit. And especially for the Makai. For all these little animals that brought me to tears the last time. For the plants that are disappearing. For this little garden of Eden that has to be protected. It's above all for that that the whole project has to work out. That evening, the team consults the tribe chief. We never go into the massif. We don't like the spirits that are there. We've never been to see what lies on the other side of the mountain. 
It won't be easy finding people to accompany you. In the morning, the team begin their trek into the wild. But the porters will stop at the entrance to the Massif, an eight-hour walk from the village. The natives believe evil spirits lurk in the shadows and tell tales of giant crocodiles and deadly canyons. There is no path. The vegetation is too dense. The only way to keep going is to follow the rivers. Walking against the current is exhausting. We're discovering a world that no one's ever seen before, that no one's ever studied or explored. Everywhere we go, we'll be the first to have set foot there. It's quite simple. It's as if we were going to the moon, except that it's not so far. But everything will be a discovery here. If the team's discoveries match their expectations, Everard will attempt to convince the local authorities to protect the Mackay from development and human destruction. There's a river in this forest which heads back that way. It's called the Menampanda, and it's the main river here. It goes up and up and splits up into different branches a bit higher up. That's really where our playground will be, with everything waiting to be discovered. And I think there'll be something for everyone. There's one major problem, and that's storms. Really. Because we're in a drainage basin, and if it rains heavily on the plateau, which is up there, which is called Vohib Makai, that river swells very quickly, in addition to this one. So you mustn't stay in the canyons after 4 p.m., or even 3 p.m. if it's cloudy because it generally starts raining a bit around there. Entomologist Brian Fisher doesn't wait for the end of the meeting to start work. Every minute counts. There are species to be found. Oh, wow, that's a nice species. Spider. Oh, look at that. Oh, wow, a nice. Oh, this is one of the smelly beetles. Yeah. Woo. Ugh. Smells really bad. Oh, look at the pseudoscorpion. Ah, now, that's not a beautiful. I don't think we should leave the camp. The camp is excellent. We should just stay here. It's all there. In the beginning, you can't see them. When you come, your eyes are adjusted to the city. Your eyes are adjusted to the cars moving around. It's like you can't even perceive that, uh, that detail. That, and the more you sit, and each day you sit, the more you can see the more it becomes kind of revealed to you. And that's when I feel the most alive. It's in a sense that simplicity of the life here in which makes everything so much richer. There it is. The insects fly. They don't see the black. They try to escape. They don't see this. And they work their way up all right in. From the outset, the scientists study the various species to be found around the camp, spending long hours observing. Others attempt to capture certain animals to take DNA samples. Like Vincent Prier, his mission is to draw up an inventory of all the bats present on the island.
Anne Lodissois sets traps to capture small rodents. She inspects their fur for fleas, lice, and ticks that transmit serious diseases, such as bubonic plague, which is still prevalent in northern Madagascar. It's not terribly effective. Fortunately, there are no ants. There. That's much better. Okay. We might get some microcebus, little mouse lemurs. But we might have some elyras, which are little mice climbing in there, triggering the mechanism. When you see the climate here, you know right away that you don't want to be going out during the day. It's so hot. And you can understand why most of them come out at night. What I can do to offer the finest self-service is to take some dried banana, and I put it on a little stick, like that, and then he'll have to come all the way out here to get it. There we go. In the evening, the expedition members analyze the day's discoveries. After the evening meal, the camp is transformed into a laboratory where all the specialists exchange ideas and their experiences. Returning to his net, Vincent discovers more than 70 bats. To his great surprise, all of them are the same species. However, he only needs a single specimen to examine and take a DNA sample. It will take several hours to free the little creatures from the trap. Come on, baby. Oh, this one's got an insect in its mouth. They were eating. Vincent, have you got the scissors? One of them's got something around its neck. I'm worried about it. Okay, oh, okay, that's all right. I don't need the scissors now. It's freed itself. Mops, not a very interesting species. Oh, it's there. Let it go. Let it fly away. You're not afraid it's going to leave? Oh, hang on. It's gone straight into the water. Apparently, they're good swimmers. Put it on a tree. <gasps> Elodie! What? An enormous chameleon! Chameleons may have their origins in Madagascar, which today is home to nearly half of all the 150 known species. Where is it? Oh, it's there. It's got such a great little face. It's nice, huh? Wow. <laughs> Super. Have you seen its muzzle? A bit like a little pig. In fact, it's one of the species that emits ultrasound through its nose. They've got this whole little system for focusing. Okay. And little piggy ears. <laughs> great face. So... Super. The forearm, 87, it's a monster. 
Let's just take a skin sample and then let it go. In fact, the cut closes up really quickly. That's why we do it here. Okay. And it doesn't bother it? It doesn't affect its flight and it heals really quickly. Did you check if it has fleas? No, I forgot about that. Can I blow on its back? You don't mind? I don't mind, no. I don't know about her. But hey, what are you doing? My little bats are all clean. Being the first to come here and study these bats in the Makai, it's a real trip. There are so many adventures ahead, a world of dreams. You can imagine almost anything. Shall we let it go? Go for it. There's a whole world of mystery around bats, which really affects you when you're alone at night, waiting by the nets, waiting for something to happen. You can't hear anything, you don't hear them coming, and you check the nets from time to time, and bang, there's 70 creatures in the nets. Vincent will spend the night in the forest canopy, observing the bats' nocturnal activities. We just have to wait now. American geneticist Edward Lewis and a small team will attempt to approach the lemurs in the rainforest this morning. Lemurs are emblematic of Madagascar. They're named after the lemurs, the ghost of spirits of ancient Roman mythology, no doubt inspired by their piercing cries and reflective orange eyes. To track and find them, the scientists follow their calls excrement and the remains of food scraps. This piece of bamboo, yeah. okay. And they, they take this off. off. Yeah. yeah. And they eat just the just a little bit. Yeah. Just the a cat. little bit this. Yeah. Take this off again yeah. and eat this. The the, the whitish part. Yeah. The lighter and part. Drop the rest drop of it. it. Yeah. You found the food? Yeah. Yeah, look How fresh. Ah. Oh this is real fresh. Yeah. So you what, should... how, how how long ago? Uh, last night or this morning. Wow. Fresh. So, despite they haven't been seen physically, they're here. Yeah. And just recently they've been here. Yeah. Yeah. You see it? Yeah, I think so. You can get it? Be low. The aim of Ed and his team is to take genetic samples from the lemurs to map out their presence on the island. They catch the animals using a tranquilizer gun. Got it. Got it. There it goes. Over there. The tricky part is capturing the lemur within 30 seconds of firing the anesthetic dart so it doesn't injure itself as it falls. Go, go, go. It's moving. It's moving. Let out. Let's go. Let's go. Way up there. Get ready, open up. Farther. Get blues. Here it comes, here comes, comes, coming. Go. All right, all right, good job. All right. Okay, good deal. All right, she's good, yeah, she's good. She's good. Oh, yeah, good deal. I guess I have to get to work now. While the lemur is asleep, Ed examines it to check its health. Is she friendly? Not yep. too scared? She's beginning to wake up, so she's a bit agitated. Did he analyze her already? No, he's going to do it. He's going to do that now? Really. 
example. But I have already several, so we can maybe let her rest then, if you want. Yeah. Some lies there and the larvae here. You, you will analyze her later. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> the first thing that we always put first is the safety of the animal. Um, every animal that you see in Madagascar is critically endangered. Um, this forest is disappearing, the habitat's disappearing. And so when you mobilize a lemur, you want to do as much as you can um, to make sure that lemur is going to go back to the forest. Everard thinks he's found some tombs hidden in these caves. On the eve of the expedition's third day, he sets out to explore them with archaeologist Eric Gonthier. If they are tombs, it would mean that man has lived in the region before. In pre-colonial times, the island was divided up into rival kingdoms. Each ethnic group was historically attached to a region. The villages around the Mackay were once home to the Sokolov people. They were driven out of the region in the last century by the Bara, who still live here. Oh. That is beautiful! Magnificent. That is a heck of a landscape. That makes our day magnificent. It's nice and cool. Oh, I've never seen that before. The guide is worried about being so close to the dead. He addresses the spirits to apologize for disturbing their rest. Lift it up. Wait. Wait. Let's put it down. Put it down. That is a beautiful stone. Beautiful. That's excellent. Magnificent. So, so. What do we have here? It's in very good condition. It's surprising. I'll look at the skull to see what state the teeth are in. The teeth are a bit worn, with a little decay, very, very slight decay, but the teeth are extremely healthy. So these were people who ate well. I'd say they were people of around 35, 40 years old. And maybe we can look at the skull, too. It's covered with cobwebs. An earth, yes. We're dealing with a woman. I'll put her back in her place of rest. Yes, it's a woman. And there are two pieces of jewelry there. Oh, yes, that's pretty. Some fine jewelry here. Look, they're perfectly symmetrical all along. It corresponds exactly. That's fantastic. That's real jewelry making. That's really some very professional work. It's remarkable, quite remarkable. I think I'll take a look back here. I've got the impression there's an opening. We can see there. Oh, there? Yes, hey, there's some bones back here. No way. Bones? How many? Some quite long bones. How many are there? I can see two. I reckon the body's like this. It's lying like that? Yes. That means it's parallel to the other one we've found. All right. Okay. So we can confirm that we're dealing with a Sakalava tomb and not a Barra tomb. If what they have found is really a Sakalava grave, 
it would explain the porter's reluctance to enter the hills. They are afraid of the spirits of the Sokolov people, who they attacked and drove away in the last century. The dust in there. The graves are almost inaccessible, but benefit from an exceptional view. The Sokolovs buried their dead at altitude, so they could watch over the world of the living below. Close to camp, Anne has caught a big rat. She's worried she may find parasites carrying the bubonic plague. They're quite impressive in terms of size. We'll see if it's got fleas. Fine, ratchet, ratchet. Hello. Big eyes, big ears. Yes, and big hind legs. Don't worry, I'll let you go. Oh, look, there's one there. Yes, he's got fleas. Yes, I saw them. Excellent. The parasites the rodents carry are vectors, transmitters of diseases. So what happens? Well, in fact, if a rat is sick with rabies, the fleas suck the rat's blood where the bacteria circulates. And once it stops circulating, when the animal is dead, the fleas leave the body and they'll try to find another host. And if the first warm-blooded animal that comes along is a man, then the flea jumps on the man and transmits the disease to the man. So our conservation work involves not only the natural habitat, but also everything we can't see, the viruses and bacteria that could be responsible for certain mortalities, like Ebola, for example, which has killed a lot of gorillas in Central Africa very recently. This is Elodie Coutois' first scientific expedition. She enthusiastically returns to camp every day with new specimens to study. She has just caught a boa, whose presence here intrigues the scientists. Boas, originally from South America, thrive here in Madagascar, but are not found in Africa. 113. Not too bad. Uh, Versus Rose mid-body, yeah. mean 43, 39 to 50. And, then, yeah. and this one here is 41 to 51, mean 45. Right. This one, mm -hmm. uh, the two, two, two species, mm -hmm. uh, Colubrinus and Meridionalis. Elodie will return the boa to the wild and come back with more species. A few hours away from the campsite, Everard and the archaeological team have discovered a new cave. That's really, really old. That's mortar there. Oh, no. Oh, I don't believe it. Oh, there are two of them. Sarcophagi. It's incredible. Yes. It's incredible. Unbelievable. The moment Everard enters the tomb, the wind rises and a storm breaks out. This is excellent. There's a difference between the two, no? Yes, they both have more or less the same sculptures, the same drawings, but one of them is painted blue. Ah, that's important. But not the other one. Although it has sculptures on the ridge. There's a zebu, two houses, and a vase. Which one is the biggest? The blue one. Okay, so there, there you see, you have a king's tomb. Oh. Yes, that's a king's tomb, and probably to the left there, where you have the zebu, that indicates that there is property inside. All right. 
Yeah, he's showing us his personal assets. He departs with his possessions. Everything he owns. Right, there are Zebus to say that he had lots of Zebus. Yes, it symbolizes his house, everything that he owned. It's pretty impressive looking at all this. I'll take some photos. Yes, yes, take some photos. Try and shoot as much as you can so we can analyze it all with the pictures. Geez, what the heck is in there? This is all a bit creepy. This is another Sokolov tomb. They were the only people of the Massif to use a sarcophagus. I feel like opening it, but at the same time, I'm not very comfortable. We're dealing with something, I would say, much more than a century old. There are no metal nails, nothing. Everything is woodwork. It's pretty amazing. We have here a very important archaeological site. They're lying with their heads to the north and their feet to the south, very precisely. Everard emerges from the tomb to find he is alone. By the storm, Everard, Eric, and their guide are forced to spend the night in a cave with no food or water. Didn't you hear us calling out when we left? Right, you called out to me. Really? <laughs> well, if you were back in the hole, you wouldn't hear anything. Well, I really wasn't expecting that. Two coffins. That was incredible. Hey, we've got a visitor, a Chiroptera. It's a bit weird coming out of a tomb with a sarcophagi and then seeing the elements stirred up all around. Oh yes, mythology comes to life. There are tales to tell. Are you hungry? Am I hungry? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Off to sleep. The next morning, Everard leaves the archaeological team. He is eager to explore new regions of this feral landscape. The McKay is filled with lush green valleys, each one more isolated and enchanting than the others each one with the promise of a new adventure. What is that thing there? Don't you see anything in the lake? There's something floating there. What is that? What is that? It looks like a croc. Brilliant. Yes, it's a croc. Vince Shacks and Richard Boltar have studied crocodiles in South Africa for many years. In order to take DNA samples and carry out tests, they're going to have to catch one. Once we've got it, um, on land, okay? Um, the noose will still be around. If it is a big one, and we're in one of those tight spots, just be careful if we line it up against, like, if there's a tree anywhere here or here. 
what he often do is tap, tap his tail, feel the tree, and then hook his tail around the tree, and then he's got power. So we just need to make sure that that tail is always... If you feel it's got power, but you don't know where it's coming from, look back and you'll often see it. Looking for fish, Tongi has spotted a crocodile. He leads Vince and Richard along the river to the area. It's extremely difficult capturing a specimen in this region. The terrain is unsuited to the usual approach techniques. Here, the crocodile has the advantage of stealth. But thanks to their experience, Vince and Richard are ready to accept the challenge. We were going upstream. Jean was there. And I went this way. I saw it right. You see the, uh, the reed? Yeah. yeah. At the base of the reed, there's yeah. a little, like, sand yes. spit. Yes, 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 yes. Right. It was, like, walking on this, and it went right to the water. I was maybe, like, 10 meters ahead of where we are now. <laughs> right. During the dry season, a crocodile is capable of surviving several months without food. But now, at the start of the rainy season, it's a good time to hunt them. But the water level has risen during the night and covered the banks, eliminating all trace of the crocodiles and making the hunt very dangerous. Despite Vince's experience, it's impossible to detect the crocodile's presence. Guys, I don't, I don't think we should carry on here. Eh? This water's just a little bit too deep, and I'm a bit concerned, you know, that we just getting a little bit too deep, and there's, you know, we can't, we don't have control of what's going on now. So I think maybe we just turn around and go back to the main channel. The expedition along the river is becoming too dangerous. So Everard takes Vince to the canyon where he had seen a crocodile the wow. day before. <laughs> This is the Things look hopeful the again, but there's a new problem to overcome. The lake seems to be inaccessible. What do you think? Oh, it's incredible. It's unbelievable. <sighs> it's nice amazing. place, right? No, it's stunning. You, you go on the water or? You take it. We need a boat. Oh, you need a boat? Yes, yeah. we need a boat. Okay. So we have to go down with a boat. We, we're going to have to go down with a boat. <laughs> OK. And get the boat down there. I think once we've got it's the boat down there, the, the hard work's done, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to pull it towards me, right? Uh, yeah, it would be better if you pulled it towards you. OK. The problem is most of this vegetation, I think, is floating. floating. So there's a good chance that he's going to go underneath. I think he's The McKay could be home to a new species of crocodile, or the last refuge of an endemic Madagascan crocodile, eliminated in populated areas by man hundreds of years ago, known today only through fossil remains. It is an adult crocodile. Um, and we're, we're on an inflatable boat, so I, you know, I can see it pulling us around quite a bit, and you know it's. We're not going to have complete control of, of where that croc goes or where we go anyway, so... You know, have limited time, like an expedition like this. 
you've got to get in there and you've got to get the samples as quickly as you can and you know get what you can while you're there so that's what we've got to do so it's exciting After two days searching without any luck, Vince decides to adopt his favorite technique, night reconnaissance. Test it out, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Eh? From the top of the cliff, he sweeps over the lake with a powerful light. If the beam picks out the crocodile's red eyes, the animal will freeze, stunned. It will then be easier to use a noose to catch it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to give up with the last fight. After long hours of waiting, there are no crocodiles, but they manage to capture one of the fastest flying insects in the world. This catch is something of an accomplishment. The Sphingidae can reach speeds of 35 miles per hour. So, Brian, tomorrow when we give them those insects, you're going to go completely nuts. Yeah. over the moon. At least they won't return to camp empty handed. Right. See you in an hour. Richard and Vince awoke every hour to survey the lake, in vain. But they plan to return every night until they find the elusive reptile. Oh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Look at that! Look at that face! You know, this thing has spent probably the last two years underground, and because of the rains came, they, they, they've been crawling out and hatching, in a sense. They're like caterpillars. They go through a complete metamorphosis. They're something very different as a child, and uh, they have a, a, a piercing, sucking mouth part here that sticks in the phloem, and they suck the juices, the sugars of trees, roots, and then they're us ah, as an adult. Now, People always say, well, what do they eat as an adult? Well, adult insects aren't really interested in eating. They're interested in reproducing, so they're... Uh... Brian has devoted his whole life to insects. He has high hopes for this expedition, as he's never had access to this isolated region of Madagascar before. Hey, hey. Gonna check this out. But up close? Oh, it's pretty hard, huh? The uh, fun part of... No, no, I, don't, I won't go. I won't go over to your tent. It's just right here. Yeah! -ho! This is a big soldier. That is a big. Look at that. To do the identification and description of this wonderful species, we need the soldier. And um, the workers are often easy to get, but now we have a soldier. All right. Well, let's go collect some more ants. Brian has discovered several hundred species of ants. An impressive feat. Insects represent two thirds of all animal species on the planet. If I disappear into a hole, you'll tell the others, right? <laughs> Tanguy and Jean Reberta have already identified eight species of fish in McKay waters, but none specific to the region. 
so they continue to search in more hostile and remote environments. Freshwater fish are rare and endangered in Madagascar because of deforestation, which accelerates erosion, causing silt and sand to block up the small streams the fish need as breeding grounds. Jean, I've got one. That's it, Tangi. We've got our reward. It's an adult male. We've got an adult male. I hope he doesn't jump. There, that's okay. He's much more colorful than the female. More colorful in the green and blue shades, in fact. There's some blue in the dorsal fin area and some yellow. Tangi and Jean have finally discovered a new species of Pocky Poncax, a small freshwater fish that is very rare. At present, there are six species described in Madagascar, and this is the seventh. This species has barely been discovered because we've just discovered it, but it's already extremely endangered. We think we actually discovered a relict population of a fish which was once much more widespread in the Mackay. In fact, the most endangered vertebrates in Madagascar are the fish, and even us scientists have taken our time to discover them. Ten years ago, we thought there were very few fish species in Madagascar, but then we realized that we quite simply hadn't prospected enough. There are many isolated zones, like the Mackay in Madagascar, where people have never been to take samples. Tonight, the camp comes alive with song and dance a celebration of the scientists' dedication and the success of the mission. It's the fourth night out for Vince and Richard. Determined to find a crocodile, they venture out onto the lake at night, defying the danger. Yeah, great feeling, you know. Finally, something, you know, our sample, you know, the, the DNA is DNA. Okay. It's not to vent. The kind of region like Madagascar, it's an island completely isolated. And within the island, you have different islands of other ecological systems. There's a good chance that there's going to be some form of speciation with this crocodile. There's a good chance that the croc is going to be adapting to Madagascar-specific conditions. We know that the crocodile is important for a system. For, for an aquatic system, it's a top predator. Um, it's absolutely essential that it survives um, as a keystone species. And, you know, that's, 
I, I, you know, I feel a certain amount of responsibility for getting the word out there, to letting people know that while the crocodile is very important for, for the ecology and, and for food, if you're relying on fish, it's also very dangerous. So if people tell me they're scared of crocodiles, I say, well, that's a good thing. Stay scared of crocodiles. They put on a great show, Vince and Richard, and then came back with a little crocodile measuring 62 centimeters. It was pretty funny. They put so much effort and energy into it. But the main thing is to know the type, the species of these crocodiles. So it's enough to have a 62 centimeter crocodile. Everard and his team are halfway through their adventure. Three weeks have gone by, and the expedition has gathered plenty of samples. Each day, the scientists head deeper and deeper into the maze of canyons. Using inflatable dinghies, a small team sets out toward the center of the massif. Primatologist Rainer Dolch has come to the Mackay in pursuit of hapolemurs, or bamboo lemurs. Until now, they've only been seen in eastern Madagascar, 180 miles from here. Discovering a new species of lemur is a secret dream for Everard. He has a hunch that the Mackay is protecting an unknown species of these little primates, the guardians of a lost Eden. It's about the right habitat, and uh, they would also like to sit on, on trees like that. If we actually found one here, that would be really cool, because that would be the first bamboo lemur from this region, and it would also be one of the, well, one of the bamboo lemurs that we believe could be a new species. Day 28 of the expedition. For two days, Vincent and Brian have watched bats entering a remote cave, not knowing how to reach it. Finally, they find a tiny crack and manage to squeeze through it, discovering the nocturnal flyer's vast refuge. Are you gonna make it? I think so. Ah. Whoa, this is pretty deep. The bats travel mostly at night, 
flying in the dark using sonar, which emits ultrasound calls that echo from objects around them, informing the bats of the distance and nature of the obstacle. By day, they rest in caves or tree bark, venturing out at night to feed on insects. Wow, this is beautiful. Huge cave. It's a huge cave, and listen, you can still hear the bats. We're getting closer. Yeah, I think that's somewhere around. Wow. That's fantastic. It's beautiful. I can hear them from over there. In order to capture a bat, they'll have to set a new net. There are some bats flying around over there. We're probably just them. Yeah, they look like a large group. So maybe it's worth putting a, a net just there. And uh, if we are lucky enough, one or two will get caught. After a day spent waiting in the cave, Vincent finally captures two different species of bat. One of them may be unknown. Notomops madagascariensis, which is great. It's really a spectacular species, one of the creatures I wanted to catch in coming here. I was thinking if there is one there, I want to see it. So as we were freeing it from the net, it was like, wow! Notomops madagascariensis with its big ears flopping over its muzzle, it's fabulous. And then, as we explored deeper into the cave system, we found three of these little reddish colored bats. And that was really exciting. Look at this. It's really pretty. All reddish. The bat is likely a myotis. However, Vincent is intrigued by its reddish fur. It appears quite different to the previously described myotis species. But only DNA analysis, once the mission is over, will enable him to be sure. Reiner has still not given up on finding a bamboo lemur. He sees a bamboo stalk that appears to have been nibbled, probably by a lemur. A moment of magic. A whole family of bamboo lemurs emerges from the cliff. Tiana discovers some fresh excrement. They can take samples and test the DNA to know the origin. Rainer is pleased, as he can now confirm that bamboo lemurs live in this isolated region. It is proof that the entire island of Madagascar was once covered in forest 
allowing the animals to move around freely. Long day, nice to see you, give me five. We found it. No way. We did. Really? We did. Where? Up there in the, in the second canyon where the lake is. This expedition was really born out of a feeling, an intuition, or desire to see these hills as a treasure. It was a very personal thing. So now, seeing the enthusiasm of all these scientists, all these researchers, and seeing all their discoveries every day, I'm convinced I was right to bring them here. It's cool that you can catch them in traps, because otherwise I would have had quite a hard time catching them. But looking at the reference pictures, they do look quite alike. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can let go now. <laughs> Come on. You got a piece of meat, Vivian? Come on, let go now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After exploring the area around the camp, the team want to take advantage of their last two weeks to explore further afield. Despite their already exceptional discoveries, they are convinced that the McKay has not yet revealed all its secrets. The very next morning, Eric discovers a fossil site. Oh, no, no. Look at this. Oh, this is a big bone. It's short. It looks like a hippopotamus. The last hippos would have been exterminated when man arrived on the island, about 200 BCE. Well, that's it. We've hit the jackpot. They're not teeth, they look like tusks. This is typical. You see the angle, where the tooth is worn. That is typical of a hippopotamus. It's really fantastic. I know somebody's going to sleep well. Tonight, yes, this is wonderful. I don't know what this is. It's coming, it's coming. Oh, I don't believe it. It's a croc. It's a crocodile! Oh. It's a crocodile! A snake! A mythical snake! Look, it's a crocodile! The mythological snake, as the Malagasy's call it, this could be the missing species that Vince and Richard were looking for. The two big inhabitants of the rivers here are the crocodile and the hippopotamus. So here, we're reconstructing the whole biotope at one point in time. In just a few seconds, and it was several hundred years ago. All it would have taken was a huge rise in the water level, carrying a lot of mud, and the mud would arrive quite suddenly in a gully like this one, a very narrow gully, and all the animals that happened to be there would be immediately covered over. I'm not talking about a tsunami, but something really violent, and at that point, there was nothing they could do, and that's why we find them all here together. Centuries later, man himself is still not safe from the flash floods whipped up by violent storms. The scientists have forgotten the risks and dangers of staying in the canyons after 4 p.m., unaware of the force of the storms that destroy everything in their path. So this one, that's a species I've not seen before. I'm not sure what it is. I'll have to take a closer look. It might be a blue Mercia. The 
I can't see it. It's on the palm leaf. Of course, my fault. I left my brain hurt. The water level continues to rise. All of the team members have now returned to base camp. The valley floor is quickly becoming a river. Water bottles and bags have already drifted away. The team scrambles to protect their scientific samples. We'd seen it coming, but I get the feeling some people were wondering why we set up camp here. The problem is that we really didn't have a choice. We're in a zone where we're obviously at the bottom of a canyon, and otherwise we'd have to climb up several hundred meters every day to find shelter. So we had to accept that we'd get caught in a flood. And that's what happened. Fortunately, the damage is limited. A few bags and belongings have been swept away in the flood, but they were able to keep all the samples safe and sound. Are there any shovels anywhere? If there's any way we can protect that tent, that would be good. And our camp got absolutely drenched and drowned in literally a wave of water. <laughs> and, you know, the bottom of the tent started moving and things started floating around. And I opened the tent and someone's shoes came flo floating past my tent. It was just chaos. Because there's only so much you can do in this rain. It does, it just makes you realize where you are, you know. There's no emergency services, there's no warnings, there's no, no one could even tell us that this sort of thing would happen. So you kind of realize where you are and you start appreciating the, you know, how extreme the environment is and it gives you a bit of a wake up call, so. Three days, the expedition will be over. There is still no trace of a new lemur species. Convinced that it is hiding in the mountains, Brian, Everard, and botanist Jackie and Rashiana set out into one of the McKay's most isolated areas. Using satellite images, the men try to access the isolated region. Rafting, climbing, and traversing, the men head further into the McKay. The zone is so inaccessible that Everard believes they will find a totally preserved ecosystem, a biohaven cut off from the rest of the world where new species could well have evolved.
90% of Madagascar's primary or old growth forest has completely disappeared. And forest fires have ravaged the area deep into the massif. It takes several hours of tough walking along mountains and desert plateaus to reach this unlikely lush haven. Oh, easy does it. Oh, nice. Holy cow. You think we can get down there? For sure we can get down there. Yeah? That, how far is we it? We have to go down there. That's really amazing to find this here, in the middle of nothing. <laughs> wow. So you want to try to go down? Let's do it. I would love to go down there. In this? Yes. Huh? Let's do it, Jackie. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, Come on. <laughs> It's like completely untouched. How many times can you go to a place untouched by anybody else? You often think you're the first one there, but you're not. But here we are the first people, for sure. But it's so beautiful. It's, it yeah. is beautiful. Pretty sure we could find lemurs in this very small area, small ecosystem. Well, maybe they come and go. Maybe. They... I'm not sure. You think they can walk that far and reach another forest so so far away? I think they can. Yeah. I think actually, we think they're not mobile, but if they migrate, I bet they go from canyon to canyon. That's that's how they disperse. I bet. Okay. Holy cow! Did you know this was here? No. <laughs> it's even bigger inside. Oh, that's huge. Wow. Ah, beautiful. It's like going inside a big cathedral. It actually continues over here. Just, just, just. Okay. Okay. I don't know how everyone's gonna fit through here. Yeah. The trek took 10 hours, and they did not find a new species of lemur. But during this trip, they have learned to accept whatever nature can offer without imposing their own will or desires. Look at that. Oh, back in the land of green. <laughs> Another new world. This is the lost world. This is a great log for ants. I have to spend one second ants? here. This, it, when it's moist like this, you can, oh, you can just pull it apart. Yeah. We got termites. I'm looking for this 
special ant called Mystrium. Why not a scorpion? Or a scorpion. <laughs> it's kind of like a window into their world. It's like a little microcosm of life and decomposition. Tu vois rien, you don't see anything. You just pass by, you see loads of rotten trunks, but he'll see one and makes his choice, and he jumps on it, caresses it, sniffs and smells it. I smell this. It's canarium, I think. I think it's impressive, investing so much passion in these little beings. They're so small. Some of them we can't even see with the naked eye. They're less than a millimeter across. And realizing that, sure, there are the great mammals, dolphins and whales and turtles that people dream about and which are regarded as emblematic animals. But at the same time, there are millions and millions of species that no one bothers about, but which are 100, 1,000 times more important for the survival of an ecosystem and basically for life. Yep, there it is, there it is. Whoa, look at that. This is the king. This is what I was looking for. I knew I had to be here. That's full. It's always that, just before you give up. There it is. Just one more look. You always have to do the one more look. Every single day here, I've collected something new. A new ant species or something. This uh, beautiful firefly went by. And uh, wait, wait, something's coming. Well, that's interesting. Look at that one. Yeah. That's a different species. Yeah. And that's a soldier. We call a major worker. Let's pause this conversation. Mm -hmm. Catch it. On this trip, we've discovered at least, at least five new species of ants. Most people think taxonomists are those people who work in museums, which are a bunch of dead creatures, a warehouse of dead animals. But no, 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 no. It's actually much more than that. A taxonomist, in a sense, has one, one really cool thing we can do. We can give names to new species. So, I'll have five new species. I have to think of names to give. Clearly, I'll give one, like, Macaensis. You know, I could name one after Evrard, who, you know, thanks to him, I was able to come. That would be Evrardi, and uh, I should name that one. Sarah Packy's Evrardi. That would be nice, huh, to it? For me. They're just dance, right? The expedition is almost over. The scientists believe they have discovered more than 80 new animal and vegetable species. This is really what the Macay is all about, a completely isolated refuge zone where we can expect to see that life has taken on a slightly different form. So we'll give a name to something new and say, there, that's what it is, it exists and it's here. And based on that, it exists and we can pay attention to it in terms of conservation management. After revealing the vast variety of McKay's biodiversity, Everard and his team now hope to be able to preserve this natural wealth. And it's urgent in view of the fact that 130 animal and plant species become extinct from the planet every day. Um, as a scientist, you know, what we do, at one level, could be looked at as almost cruel, you know? We're out there studying nature. Um, but I think that's one way in which we can actually save what's there, by giving the insects our voice, by giving uh, nature a representation back in those cities, you know, to let people think again about the world around us. Oh, the UV, light? the UV light? Oh, at night, if we go out here, yeah. we'll be able to see lots of them. Um, so we're going to give this thing uh, something to walk on to. Yeah. I feel I have an obligation to give a voice to all these insects and to make sure they're not forgotten. The faster our cities become, the taller our cities become, the further we are away from that feeling, what we found in the McKay. On the eve of their departure, the scientists don't want to leave. The natural beauty of the Mackay has entranced them. The results of the expedition are very positive. 
falloir rentrer, so now we go home, reprendre la vie, pick up a so-called normal life normal, again, and somewhere in our minds, remember the great people we've met, humaines, the beautiful ces scenery, belles, ces paysages, and the wonderful et discoveries. Et ces so have you got any parasites? Yeah. I was thinking here, maybe, in the folds of its skin. It's work, and it's a human adventure story too. And meeting so many brilliant people in such a short time is a rare privilege. We all love these animals so much. It's, it's my, been my job for 12 years. Um, I've seen 4,000 of them personally, and I've watched 4,000 of them go back to the forest. And, you know, that's a lot of pride in that, to know that, you know, that despite the, the, the danger and, and the sometimes invasiveness of our job, um, to know that we're going to put these animals back in the forest, that somebody else can study them, but more importantly, somebody can come here in Madagascar on vacation, see these animals, and get joy of taking a picture. Right here. Do you want to choose this one? Yeah, I think this is a good one. It's a good one. He's going to stay there and watch us. Look at him. You really want to give him a cuddle. It's pretty, huh? Yeah, he's adorable. This is one of the biggest bats in the world. We're looking at a wingspan of 1 meter 20 here, so that's the size of a decent buzzard. Right? We'll let it go? How do you explain this when you get home? Well, you people are going to have a lot of questions about the Makai and the trip and how was it. I have no idea how I'm going to even start to describe this place. At one level, this biodiversity here, this cultural heritage, needs to be recognized as a place of sacred beauty, of biological importance, of Real, a real place for people to connect to nature. If we don't, each year, it'll get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then poof, it's gone. I think we have everything we need now for the Massif to be protected. That's my dream. Anyway. So we still have a lot of sleepless nights ahead. Months and years of intense work. But I'm sure it will work out now. I'm sure it will work, and that's great. And I don't want to leave. The McKay remains shrouded in mystery, a hostile land not made for man. It has welcomed them briefly and revealed a glimpse of its secrets but the scientists serve a natural world that gives only of itself as it deems. The scientists have their plant and DNA samples, new discoveries for science, and a workload for years to come. A land lost in time, the McKay regains its magnificent, untamed silence. <laughs>